On our Friday night sports show, repeated Saturday morning. Uh, well, we have a special guest tonight. Uh, he is a former AFL umpire. He's joined us. Uh, a guy that says he spent most of his life trying to keep out of the limelight. Now we're going to put him in the limelight. Uh, it is none other than Richard Fox uh, who joins us on our program. G'day, Richard. How are you? Yeah, thank you, Wayne. Thank you for putting the spotlight on me. Uh, we greatly gonna, appreciate it. We're going to do it. And we've got Clayton Bester too from our uh, Arvo Flow. We've got the same vintage us three blokes. We thought we'd start and we'll bring some other guests in through the time we have together on our Friday night sports show. But first and foremost, uh, Richard, uh, what do you do today? I mean, you were once an AFL umpire back 16 games in uh, 2000 and 2001, but what, what's your role today? Yeah, a little bit different. I actually work in media, of all things, and director of Lutheran Media, Messages of Hope. So, we're, yeah, just recording interviews of people doing it tough or finding out where they've had hope just to inspire others out there who are struggling with all sorts of different things in their life, trying to give them hope. So, mm. pretty amazing. I always have hope at the start of a football game that the umpires will call it right. Uh, it doesn't always seem to go that way. I just thought I'd throw that out there. <laughs> a lot of hope uh, when you begun uh, your career in football. I want to take uh, you back a little bit for everyone. Uh, you're a country footballer, Adelaide Hills. Um, that was the area. Lobethal, I think, was your club. Tell us about your first um, game of footy and uh, how you got involved. Oh, yeah, I love footy. Footy um, was part of my life. My dad played uh, heaps of different games for Lobethal. And so, yeah, it was, a, it was a great way to grow up in a football club, um, play footy as a kid coming through in the mud and the slop of the Adelaide Hills. So um, it was great fun. So you, great memories. You Tigers, you, know, you yeah. black and gold is from Lobethal. But who was the enemy back then? I mean, it was at uh, Torrens Valley, Onkaparinga Valley. Were they, were they the, the Bulldogs? Were they the enemy? Oh, we probably had a few enemies, but Onkers, Blackwood over like the city sides that would kind of come into our league, they were always a challenge. We'd we'd rock up and we were like come up to about their waist on, on, their, on their Ruckman kind of deal. So <laughs> they were huge, but we could just run and we just ran and ran and ran. We had some really good footballers. Won an under-17 premiership there with Lobethal back in the day. And Were you any good? Uh, I wasn't, I, I could run a little bit, but I wasn't probably in and under with the football. So there were others there. I was, uh, yeah, probably a quarter of the man I am today. So I was quite skinny, <laughs> um, got buffered around, but I loved the game. So, and just loved all the strategy and playing the game, uh, and being involved in the football club was just wonderful. So mm. great upbringing and had some wonderful memories playing football. So realized though, that I was probably more suited for in an umpiring capacity. So fell into boundary umpiring one day, umpire on the B grade, someone was missed, so I said, oh yeah, someone threw me a whistle and a white shirt, and now I went with the Loby shorts on, and away we went, and uh, yeah, just step by step, worked through different levels, and into where uh, AFL footballer, eventually. Being a boundary umpire, what 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 was the buzz like? Because you would have heard the um, questionable decisions being made from the crowd, so as you know first getting that role what was it like for you what was it like for you yeah oh, it, it's interesting because you're not part of the umpiring you're actually a club person there yeah. so for me it was all just about getting the 20 bucks yes. <laughs> <laughs> so i got 20 bucks that i could buy some lunch with uh, after the game and away i went so but he actually gave you a really good insight because you did go into the rooms with them and you you got to appreciate what those guys put up with yeah. and how they approached it and what they talked about and how they encouraged each other and you know, they're trying to give the best game for these blokes out there trying to play, play a game of footy. So that was, I really appreciate it. And I got a lot of encouragement out of them. A lot of them end up being my mentors. They inspired me and encouraged me to get into field umpiring. So the very next season, pretty much, after doing a season or so of uh, boundary umpiring, they said, come out and give central umpiring a go. I thought, okay, maybe I can do that and then play, play on the Sunday in a C-grade side. C-grade thing fell over, but I went out and umpired a game of footy. And the first game I had to umpire, I said, oh, we won't give you anything too conspicuous. But they gave it, it was Lobethal <laughs> versus Adelaide Lutheran. Oh, oh, and yeah. I couldn't have had a more obvious game if they tried. So that was that was fun. But my second game ended up being an all-in brawl just before half time, And the away side went home. <laughs> so oh. I didn't have the most auspicious start to my umpiring How career. How old were you when you first uh, did your senior umpiring role uh, as, like, obviously a young man at that time? 
Yeah, I'll, I'd come through like uh, under 17s, so I just finished off under 17s football, so started boundary umpiring and then playing a little bit. So it was about when I was about 19, actually, mm. 18, 19, I started field umpiring and doing that. So you're running around with blokes that, yeah, massive big blokes, obviously, as a young kid, um, and trying to tell them what to do and how to play the game, and it was yeah. an interesting experience. So. Yeah. Mm. What was your first A-grade game uh, in country footy? Was it a country match it was, or did you do that in uh, Adelaide? Yeah, like, um, so A grade, certainly up in the Adelaide Hills. Yeah. So, um, and I reckon my first game was actually Lobethal uh, versus Uradler. And the very oh. first free kicker pay was actually to my brother, who oh. was the ruckman for Lobethal. Oh. And the Uradler guys knew and they gave me heaps. So. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a legitimate free kick, even though my brother might say, yeah, it was a bit on the generous side. But uh, <laughs> we've got to look out occasionally for each other. But no, it was. Um, yeah, that was an amazing experience just to umpire. They ended up giving me lots of Lobethal games because that was some of the toughest games to umpire to be neutral on. So, yeah. But it developed it well and, uh, yeah, had wonderful mentors. And I actually I won the golden whistle in my second season in the Hills. Um, had an unfortunate moment with a player running into me in a final, so I missed out on doing the, the grand final that year. Oh, what happened there? Did uh, what, just uh, These days, of course, he'd get suspended for that almost, wouldn't you? When yeah, you well, the, the player did get suspended, but the coach... Coach had a rule that we had to follow. That everyone was going so well in the umpiring that if we mucked up once or made an error in law, then that we probably wouldn't go on the next week. And I, I got bowled over by him, and uh, he ended up getting a few matches. Sadly, I just, you don't want any of those incidents to ever happen. But um, because I was a bit rattled and I didn't actually give him a red card at the time to send him off, um, I just gave him a, a yellow and a free kick or something. Yeah, it cost me a game the next week. So I end up missing out umpiring the grand final because wow. of it. So, yeah, there's consequences in umpiring that I don't think a lot of people see. Yeah. So, but, um, yeah, it's, it's quite... Um, yeah, there's a lot of scrutiny on us, not just from the spectators. <laughs> Richard, you said you got the golden whistle after two years. So you must have built up some respect from the players as well. How did you? What What was the process in getting that? Because it's not an easy thing for any kind of official to gain the respect of the players around them. So, what were you doing that enabled you to get that respect from them? Yeah, well, my my dad, being a fo- uh, footballer for years, he just said, just keep communicating, keep talking to them, treat them as people, and respect them. So, a lot of the time, I would just communicate, try and be open with what I was doing, what I saw in the free kick. If you make a mistake, go, yep, I stuffed that one up, but let's just keep moving. Um, or <laughs> later in life, they said, oh, even if you make a mistake, make it like it was the best decision you made every <laughs> for the rest of your life. And then it's amazing <laughs> how many people believe you. So, but uh, no, I I just love the game, and I think my love of the game and I enjoyed being out there and wanting the best game for those guys out there and just constantly looked after the ball player. So people knew when I rocked up that they could go for the football and they'll be completely protected and had some great games of football. Yeah, and you have a beer at the end of the game with them. You you Mm. join in on that spot. So football clubs are an interesting environment and a great environment. So... Uh, yeah, so I had a really positive feedback, and thankfully that during that second year in the hills, Lobethal were doing very well, so <laughs> yes. um, there wasn't a lot of pressure on me to do uh, do too much there. But um, yeah, great fun. Well, mm. what happens um, uh, to get from say country football umpiring a young man, probably twenty years of age at this point, with the golden whistle in your hand? Uh, do you say, you know, I really like this caper, or I might uh, sort of do the uh, interleague match, or uh, do I get um, to go to Adelaide and do Sandful? Uh, how did that happen? Did somebody invite you, or did, was there a coaching panel that uh, had a look at you and said, yeah, this Richard Fellas, uh, not, not such a bad, even though he's from Labour, thought he's not such a bad bloke. <laughs> yeah, thankfully I had someone who'd seen me umpire in the hills and had gone down to the SA NFL and said, oh, you've got to come up and look at this kid. So they sent someone up and it was at Mount Lofty in the middle of winter and it was an absolute pigsty there and oh, it was so muddy. Cold. I think that the observer who came to have a look at me lasted to half time. I don't know what he got out of it, but he said, come on down to Adelaide and try your heart out. So I went to Adelaide and I remember it was Shane Harris's actually uh, first year and there wouldn't be no joke, there were 120 umpires out there and his first night he laid down the law and said, there's only going to be 40 of you blokes left. And I knew I was like the last one there. So I'm thinking, I got much of a chance here. So, but I just had a crack. I've had a few footballer mates that said, just have a go, see what happens and let the decisions um, come what may. So I did. And I ended up having my very first game uh, was a curtain raiser back in the day to the Adelaide Crows. Oh, wow. And I remember walking out in a football park and going, I never thought I'd ever get here. I thought I'd just be like your average C grade, B grade footballer. 
um, had no no ambition to be in that spot. But just through words of encouragement, people encourage me, go, oh, why don't you give this a go? Why don't you come down and do this? And there I was, umpiring yeah, on Football Park, going, this is, uh, this is a bit surreal. Wow, in front of a, a major crowd. Look, this is an uh, interview on our Friday night sports show repeated on Saturday morning. Richard Fox is our guest. Uh, he has umpired at the AFL level, and we're going to come back and find out uh, just how he got there and uh, some of the decisions that he's made, some of the uh, people he's umpired, and uh, to some of uh, his post-football work. Uh, it's our Friday night sports show. Continuing our Friday night sports show, great to have your company across New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia. Richard Fox is with us in our studios. Uh, He is today actually a qualified Lutheran pastor, but uh, he has had a career in the media and uh, he also has had a career in football umpiring. And uh, Clayton and I are with him uh, at the moment talking about uh, his career. And we've got up to the point where he umpired uh, in a curtain raiser to the Adelaide Crows match at Footy Park. We're going back, of course, uh, back in to the uh, 1990s, I'm sort of guessing. Would that be around the time, Richard? Yeah, that's right. 96, I think it was, so back mm. in the day. Yeah. All right. So tell mm. us, um, at that point in time, how did you get a gig in the SNFL? Did you start at reserves level or under 18s or under 19s? Uh, how did you start your career at a state umpiring level? Yeah, well, well, thankfully I came at an interesting time. There was a bit of change. So traditionally you had to pretty much spend a whole year under 17s and under 19s and then reserves, and it might take you four to five, even half a dozen years before you even had a sniff of even getting into do a league game back then. So a lot of pressure. But I joined a new coach and joined in. So my first game was an under 19s, and it was actually the grand final replay. So curtain raiser. So it was a pretty important game. And so to be there and to realise, yeah, I'm not running around on the Lobethal football oval or the Bridgewater mud or whatever it might be, but I'm actually in this football park environment. It was quite incredible. So, um, yeah, and to journey in and to go on to um, reserves um, and climb the ranks was pretty amazing. It's interesting you're saying stepping onto that hallowed ground of footy park. Richard, you and I share something because I've also stepped onto that hallowed ground Flo, man, have you ever played or done anything on Football Park? No, okay, there you go. <laughs> I think I might have walked the dog up and did some shopping at West Lakes once. I think uh, since it's been pulled down, but no kicking catch. League. I played mini league on oh, Footy Park. Yeah, yeah, yeah back good. in 1977. Yeah, so. I, I never actually got to the, the mini league. I wasn't uh, as good a player as either of you two were in your days. So I, I, I did we'll actually, I did go to the only Oval and watch my brother play in the mini league Port Adelaide and Sturt uh, uh-huh. back in the day in the 70s. But uh, getting back to the 90s now, Rich. <laughs> uh, let's uh, talk about uh, your first reserves game and league game. I mean, how did that happen? Yeah, um, I can't quite remember my first reserves game, but I remember the first season. It kind of helped set me up really well. And then came around my second season, and uh, I remember the coach coming to me and saying, yeah, you're doing really well. We want to give you your first A-grade game. And I thought, okay, wow. And uh, it was on Adelaide Oval. And I'd never been on Adelaide Oval up to that point. And Adelaide Oval, uh, in my history, was the best oval I've ever umpired on. So wow. just the, the quality of the ground and what it meant. But, yeah, so it was um, – so, yeah, going there and bouncing the football for the first time. And you can – on that Adelaide Oval with the cr- cricket pitches, you could put it into orbit. So oh, wow. um, it was a great feeling. Any Actually, good, the eerie – good, Any good at the bounce? Um, it would, uh, Bouncing does wonders for your prayer life, if I can say <laughs> that. Um, you're kind of coming in going, dear Heavenly Father. Father, please help this bounce go up right. Yes, so, yes. Um, but generally it was pretty good. I didn't get as high, you know, I wasn't as high a bouncer as some of my mates, but um, I was pretty consistent. So, But it was weird that first day because it was Centrals versus South and it happened to beat Adelaide Oval. But in the background, because I had a video recording when I watched my own first game, it was the bell on the, uh, the Anglican church rang the whole game. So I wonder if there were some echoes going on there, but I'm not quite sure about what, where I was meant to head. But no, amazing game. I ended up umpiring five games that year. And then I thought I'd come back and do more senior A-grade games or league games the next season. But I forgot to do a pre-season. And, uh, well, didn't quite forget. Just didn't want to. But my coach picked up on it and he put me the whole season I did reserves. He came out and said, no one will do all just reserves. You go up and down. Oh, I didn't. I just went reserves. So uh, it was a good lesson for me. Went out and did another pre-season and came back and then had a really good season at uh, SNFL League Football. Mm. Richard, you mentioned there about coaching and that's something that we don't often think that umpires have coaches and you've talked mentors and that so these coaches what actually was involved in an umpiring coaching session apart from the rules and being fit what else was involved 
Yeah, so at every game, pretty much, there's someone watching the umpires and they're taking notes of free kicks that we've paid incorrectly or uh, the like, or ones that we've missed, but also they're picking up on our positioning. Are we positioned right? Are we running right? Are we in the uh, where we need to be? So they'll give us that feedback and that tip. So feedback that's constructive, not deconstructive <laughs> like from the spectators. Yep. So, yeah, every and so when you get into then the SANFL, there's even more um, yeah, coaching and you'll have a coach during the week. So they'll take a snippet of your games with videos you'll watch them you'll critique it and you'll take that feedback on board uh, and then put that into action for the next week so um, it's a constant development you're constantly learning and learning and learning the game so to improve where you need to be how you see the free kicks and yeah what you need to focus on so so you would have been umpiring back uh, with the, the two umpire system at that stage so when we went from two umpires then you would have went to three umpires through the AFL system but how did you find the, the changes I mean do you think that we've gone uh, from one umpire back when you were a kid uh, playing footy uh, to two to three now to four uh, is there a, a great need for that as as you would have uh, maybe experienced the two umpire system and then the three umpire system yeah well I started actually my first game or one of my first games was one umpire system so and then you couldn't really see anything that was going on between the full forward and the full back you just had to go whatever yeah. happened there but uh then two umpires yeah mostly in the um, country footy and then three umpires at um SNFL league level we went to three and I think a lot of it had to do with expectations of people. The game, uh, even then, I could sense was getting more professionalised. Uh, people were becoming better athletes and running. So, and where they wanted and expected umpires to be, and how to pay those decisions. Yeah, yeah it was just physically impossible to go um, for a two umpire system. You just walk off, you'd be shattered. So, and so, and often at the end of the game, when the game is on the line and the most critical decisions need to be paid, if you're exhausted and you can't see anything for sweat in your eyes and you can't even get in the right spot then what's the benefit of that? So right. it's better to go to the three. Now, I haven't done the four umpire, obviously. That's uh, um, before, you know, it's just happening recently. So, uh, but three umpire, certainly, yeah, you had the moments there where you could get caught somewhere and get exhausted or not quite right position. So, but I think a lot of the trick is just consistency. If you can get consistency of coaching and consistency, having mantras in your mind to go, we're going to err on the side of the ball player, just pay the obvious ones and take control when required. They were my three back in the day. Um, it seemed to hold me in good stead and I could interpret the laws accordingly. Mm. So, mm. What about um, the SANFL league level? Uh, you give votes for the McGarry medal in South Australia, um, the best and fairest player. I mean, could you sort of sense when you're out umpiring, this guy's going to win the medal? And uh, did you sort of kind of, when you got to the three votes at the end of the game, you know, did you just scratch him in? Like, I mean, is there that sense amongst umpires? Do you chat about things like that? Or, or is it really in your own heart and mind you just pick the best three that you saw? Yeah, you don't do that many games consistently of one team. So you can't really, you can't, you don't get a sense of what's happened in other games. You could do like a, a, a particular Westies Sturt game, then you're doing a Nord South game and so on and so on. And so you're not getting that consistency. So, you know, you really, all you can do is go out there and pay the best you can see. The hardest games are when guys uh, go in and out of the games and you're saying, well, who's influenced the game the most? And it could be someone that's got less stats than the other person, uh, but they've had more influence. Influence. So yeah. it's in like say like full forwards and the like. They might only get ten kicks for the day, but he might have kicked ten goals. So yeah. you got to put him in. So it's yeah. We check every quarter time, half time, and just get a bit of a sense on who's going well. So yeah, yeah. interesting. Mm. What about uh, the um, comment you made about full forwards? Uh, I watch the best players even in our country comps, and a lot of the time they don't give the full forward who kicks the eight goals out of ten. They don't even get in the best three, and I, I figure that the poor old full forwards not getting looked after. Uh, are you blokes part of the problem for that, you umpires? So, <laughs> it's all about work rate, Wayne. Work yes. rate. <laughs> I, I was a bit of a full forward in my day and didn't get too many kicks apart from the two or three at full forward. Um, so the, as you got to your first game of SNFL, what, what was that? Do you remember the, uh, the league game that you first umpired? Yeah, well, that was that Central South game, and it was just amazing buzz to walk out there, and you're nervous, and uh, you you want to do the right, do it really well. The first bounce is critical. There's a bit of a tradition. I'm not sure if it exists today, but the first, if your first game, you got to do the centre bounce, and so all your focus is really on that day is on that centre bounce. Oh, yes. And if that goes up, yeah, away you go. So did you get right. a grand final or anything like that in the SANFL at that stage? Well, no. So that season after I mucked up and went all the reserves, so I did a full season. I did one final. It was the second semi, and I actually, in the meantime, had been umpiring back in the day the Teal Cup, so the under-16 and under-18 comp. So I was the SANFL 
AFL rep that went away. And I remember umpiring a game up in Brisbane, and I got the grand final in the Teal Cup. And we actually, according to the AFL coaches at the time, actually umpired better than the guys that came after us and umpired the AFL game. And uh, wow. so they actually used our game as a bit of an example, which I wasn't aware of at the time, of how you know you can go about umpiring a game and making a great game. So we were, uh, the spotlight was on me a little bit there. And so I was actually then nominated um, 10 blokes around Australia um, for four spots on the AFL list to go for. And I was told I was pretty much number 10. So because I hadn't done a grand final, only one final, and it's just a bit of a taste and see. See what it takes to come and be an AFL, elite AFL umpire. Go mm. through all the training. So I remember going out there running around and thinking, I am so far behind everyone else. <laughs> so, yeah, I was often treated as the rabbit before, uh, you know, the, the greyhounds. <laughs> they would let me go half a lap before they let everyone else go <laughs> just oh. to catch me. I, I couldn't run out of sight. So, yeah. um, But it taught me a lot about, yeah, what was expected to take that next step. So, mm. Mm. When you were the, the Chill Cup games that you were umpiring, were you aware of the players, the young players, that this guy's going to be a star? Were you aware of that? And who were they? Yeah, oh, back in the day. I remember umpiring Brad Ottens. Yeah. And there was yeah, a, Geelong Ruckman from Glenelg. Yeah, yeah. It was a really windy, wet game and no one could mark it, do anything. Yet here's this young, skinny kid plucking him from everywhere and doing all sorts like it was a dry day. I was like, okay, he's special. Matthew Pavlich, a wonderful oh. human being. Wow. Um, but he was just special. And I, he was the captain or the vice captain of the Teal Cup when I was coming through. And we had we had great conversations. He's, he had a lot of respect for everyone. Yeah. Um, and he was just wonderful. So, yeah, Scott Borlase back in the day. I remember umpiring the 19s grand final where I think um, Brett Burton tried to take James Gallagher's head off. <laughs> um, so I reported Brett Burton for attempted striking. <laughs> that sounds like a the old Norwood type of <laughs> yeah. rivalry just there. There's yeah. a bit of that. Uh, I was uh, only chatting to big Jim Michelane, whose son uh, is now playing for the Adelaide Crows uh, some years ago, and we talked about the 1975 grand final where uh, his Norwood beat Mike Lanelg, and uh, uh, there was always that rivalry between uh, the Bays and also Norwood, so interesting stuff. But uh, we're going to come back. Um, that We've got uh, Richard Fox. Uh, he's our guest uh, here in our studios, former AFL umpire, but uh, talking about uh, his career, but also about life and uh, some of the things in country football and we're going to bring more of that after this. Well, it's the Friday Night Sports Show, repeated Saturday morning. Uh, a special feature for this June long weekend for the King's birthday, we have Richard Fox, former AFL umpire, now Lutheran pastor. But he's bringing us up to date with not only his career, but things about umpiring uh, and also a lot of the health issues. We've got men's health next week we're going to get to too. But uh, in this segment, I've got Dan Crouch, our resident AFL expert. And uh, Richard, you're under the microscope. Your umpires don't like to be under the microscope too much, no, we try and shy away from it. So it's a bit awkward here, Wayne. So yeah, it is. No, I don't. <laughs> okay, so Dan, I'm going to give you the golden question. His first AFL game is coming. So Richard uh, and Dan, here we go. This is um, our interesting part of our interview time together where we're talking about uh, Richard's career at AFL umpiring. Begun in the year 2000, went through to 2001, 16 matches over two years. Um, what was the feeling like to be selected from that panel? Yeah, it was pretty amazing. Like, I was told I was 10 out of the four guys going. But um, sadly, a couple of my mates fell over, but I went better than expected. I remember going out and playing uh, Adelaide versus Melbourne. I paid my first free kick against Mark Rusciuto. Kind of looked at me, didn't know who I was, and said, you won't last long. I'm not wasting my breath on you. So... Um, <laughs> Probably fair enough. So, and away I went. Then in my second game was at Waverley, you know, the big Waverley. It's in Hunter Houses now, but massive ground. And it was Pagan Paddock. So it was Kangaroos versus Brisbane. It was a uh, preliminary final replay, and they hated each other. So I remember going out there, and I was trying to sort out between Wayne Carey and Justin Lepich. And they were big guys, hated each other, and uh, all sorts. But went better than expected. And so, yeah, I remember getting the phone call and uh, hearing that I was actually selected to be an AFL umpire was pretty special. So um, it was amazing. I want a mate of mine. He didn't get on the list, so it was quite an interesting experience. But, um, yeah, to then go on and umpire my first AFL game was something I could never have dreamed I'd ever get to that level. So after those pre-season games, what was your first game at the AFL level for premiership points? Well, <laughs> interesting. So it was at the MCG. So it was the first time I've pretty much been to the MCG, and they give you the first bounce, so I was nervous as already. So, so your, but your, being your a, first game yeah. is on the MCG. Yes. Oh. So big oh, stage. So, oh, that's, that's amazing, Richard. How did that 
How did it feel? Oh, Just... it was. Uh, I remember practicing bounces, and I reckon I put one bounce, not maybe more than one, to centre half forward, centre half back. And Into I thought, the Melbourne members, oh, almost. this is going to not, and this is not going to go well. And I had the first bounce. I remember looking at the flashing light from Channel Seven, saying, "Yep, you got to start the bounce." I'm going, "I know I do, but this has got to go up straight." So, as I said earlier, it's wonders for your prayer life and trying to settle things down. But yeah, being a Lutheran pastor, um, and again, a game that maybe you know I can just go under the radar. Here I was at the MCG umpiring games and umpiring two teams that are probably most connected to the Christian faith. So <laughs> I don't know if you wanted to guess, but it was pretty much, it was St. Kilda. So it was the Saints versus the Demons. Demons. It had to be. It had to be. Yeah, Saints versus the Demons. So yeah, yeah, Stuart Lowe and David Neitz and all that. Yeah, back in Spider Everett and Barry Hall. And, oh, wow. Yeah, Saints versus the Sinners. Yeah, yeah that's, that's right. it. A couple it. of the Sinners on the Saints there, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, You've said a few pretty big names already. Carey, yeah. Rashudo, Lepich, Hall. Who do you think was the best player that you umpired? Oh, that's a good question. For us as umpires, it's always the easiest. Who was the easiest bloke you could umpire? <laughs> Who you knew would get the footy, do something with it, and you just guarantee it time and time again. And uh, the guy that always stood out in my mind was uh, Andrew McLeod. He was just amazing to umpire. A wonderful footballer, a wonderful person, just went about did his thing, brought everyone else into the game. But what he could do, his first four or five steps to get out of a pack and made everyone look slow. So um, like even like the Pendlebury of today, mm. um, Andrew used to do that time and time again and just make old position sides look silly. But as an umpire, he was amazing to umpire because you knew if he was ever, even in the vicinity, he was going to probably get it uh, for one and two, hit someone with the, what he was trying to do. So amazing footballer. Mm. From an umpiring point of view, who were those that you wanted to emulate at that time? Uh, who were the great umpires of that stage? I mean, if you think back to who you might base your umpiring upon. Yeah, oh, that's a very good question. Um, testing my memory out here, Wayne. But um, uh, there's guys even probably just before my era uh, yep. that you're also looking at. Uh, guys like Peter Carey. Rowan Soares was the coach at the time. I was going to say Rowan Amazing, Soares, yeah. Yeah, inspiring uh, umpire and had a really relaxed way about going about things. So never put too much pressure on himself. Just went out there to enjoy it and just to have the best game for those footballers. So he was a great mentor. Shane Harris is the coach of uh, the SANFL. Instilled a lot of great um, uh, thoughts and, you know, umpiring techniques and all sorts of things but yeah there's lots of guys back in the day SANFL Mick Abbotts and Kevin Chambers and uh, coming through the Neville Huggards back up in the hills and then down to the SANFL but um, yeah trying to think of different names I umpired with uh, John Harvey and all sorts of characters back in the uh, Scott McLarens yeah, um, yeah uh, just amazing uh, Andrew Coates lots of different guys so mm. who umpired lots of games but um, no it was a real treat to actually be out there on the ground and at the MCG and I remember umpiring a game it was um, uh, at uh, Adelaide versus Fremantle and uh, it was Tony Modger's return game oh, wow. from Frio. And the game was packed. And it was amazing because I think all the Adelaide Crow supporters rocked up. And I think for the first time in their life, they supported an opposition player yeah. more than their own club. It was just an incredible atmosphere. Because so. you talked about Matt Pavlidge earlier on too. Yeah. And uh, you would have got to umpire one of the kids who you saw coming through. And uh, he became one of the greatest ever players uh, in uh, the Dockers outfit, but uh, certainly uh, a star. I'm going to ask you about, uh, was there a decision you ever paid, like one where, uh, like the old 50 metre penalty, you know, where it's going to turn the game and the crowd has gone off and you, you thought about not blowing that whistle I mean give us a couple of examples of where you've you've actually been listening to the crowd yeah I, more than once but um <laughs> <laughs> one comes to mind yeah I remember it was MCG and it was Melbourne were playing and the, there wasn't much in the game and this the Melbourne footballer coming out of defense had just simultaneously or just slightly behind uh taken this guy from behind as he was trying to take the mark and you're sitting there and the crowd's into you, you know it's close and you're going, oh, i got to be kidding me and all the spotlight on you. But in the end, I just backed my judgment, paid the free kick in the 50 metre, uh, the opposition side went on to win the game as a result. So that was, yeah, a lot of pressure. So, and, mm. Did you ever hear the crowd? I mean, the, the names that you've got called, I mean, did, did you did you ever pick up on that? Do, do you tune it out or, or, or can you hear some of those people like me, the flow man out there, <laughs> that sends a few messages to a certain few umpires when I, he's watching? I thought it was you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, no. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, you don't, it's all a bit of a dull roar. Like, I remember yeah. umpiring a game, Frio versus Collingwood, so not much at Dockland Stadium because I was there for the first year. The roof was on. They closed it in, and Fremantle were dominating the game, but Collingwood made a comeback through the third quarter, and there was a full house of Collingwood supporters, and they were going nuts. And it was kind of like, I remember trying to bounce the footy in the middle after a goal, and the noise is literally shaking my hand wow. and my chest. It's like being in front of a bass drum, and you just feel all of this, and you go, all right, let's just get this up straight for these blokes. So yeah. that's, mm. that's amazing. That's, mm. yeah, really, really cool to hear that. Now, interesting question here. Did you ever cop anything from anyone in the stands that is suitable for a Christian pastor to say on radio? <laughs> <laughs> Any particular insults that you thought were actually pretty creative and funny? Oh, like what, your mother wears army boots? or <laughs> <laughs> Most of it was all to do with my eyesight for some reason. So. Of course. <laughs> yep. Get some glasses, you up. And I'm going, well, glasses aren't going to help me. Mm. You know, anyway, you can go into the logic of it all. But, yeah, a lot of the comments defy logic. So, yeah. um, But I remember my, actually my first pre-season game of AFL, all my family and friends rocked up, and they literally wore white shirts back in the day with my number of the time oh, no. all in a row on the stand <laughs> and it was picked up on the commentary a little bit so yeah. they think who's why is that row supporting Peter Caven because he was 44 <laughs> for the Crows at the time so they didn't quite have the heart to say oh well we're actually supporting the umpire yeah. out there so. you, you don't see too many fans of the umpires <laughs> no. in the crowd I, I must say my wife dreads it when I if I was waving her she said don't wave to me at the footy because <laughs> as soon as you wave they all realize it's, that I'm connected to you and I've got to move because <laughs> so, all they move <laughs> I'm going to ask a question that Dan probably will then pick something up out of uh, this too to, to follow on with, but um, what was the pay like for you as an umpire? Was was it enough to you know, say, well, gee, I'm really glad, or did you just want to get to the top level? It wouldn't have mattered about the pay, or, uh, I mean, they fly you there, the aircraft fees are paid for and all that, but was there enough in it for you to actually do that to, instead of maybe becoming a Lutheran pastor? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, initially I just fell into it as a part-time job while I was studying to be a Lutheran pastor, and then, yeah, to go through the grades was uh, you get different amounts. There's not a lot in the SANFL level. It really is hobby. Um, it probably balances things out a little bit with expenses. But yeah, to get to the AFL list, when I signed uh, on, they gave me a twenty thousand dollar sign on fee, and then I think it was a fifteen hundred dollars a game. So for me at the time, that was a lot of money. But yeah. it probably wasn't. Yeah, what's well, not a full time job. Uh, it was just something that yeah gave you some recognition and reward for what you did. So mm. something that truly baffles me as a fan is that umpires aren't full time employees of the AFL. Do you think that's something that should happen for umpires? Should they be full time? And do you think they'll ever um, head in that direction? Oh, I think with the expectations now placed on umpires and what the AFL product is and the clubs and they're all elite and you know. Even anyone right through in the club is they're all most of them are full time in what they do, um, other than potentially volunteers. I think if the if the AFL to be truly elite, it it almost has to go to uh, to be full time umpires. Um, it doesn't mean that you're constantly focused on umpiring that full time because it, you, you you need to get out of the bubble for a bit. But it might be a case that they can come out and inspire young kids and others in the community, and also go out and help clubs and and associations that are struggling with their umpiring for whatever reason. So. Mm, that's a good question mm. and, and uh, interesting to hear your answer. We're going to come back. Richard Fox is our guest. It's on our um, Friday night sports show, repeated on Saturday morning, and we're talking uh, about uh, the very important aspect of umpiring, but also life too, and uh, some of the decisions that uh, after an AFL umpiring uh, career comes to an end, and what Richard did thereafter. That's coming up here on our Friday night sports show. Continuing our Friday night sports show, the insights into an AFL umpire, but into a man, Richard Fox, whose um, life uh, has seen so many different uh, career changes. And, well, one uh, that I want to ask you about. So you umpire for the two seasons. Did you leave the panel or did you get sacked? I mean, uh, <laughs> was were you that were you that good or uh, that uh, you decided on a different career path? I'd like to think I was that good. But, no, uh, I had a really good first season and a really good introduction into the AFL system and football and had some really good games and oh, like, copped some tough ones to start my second season. And it is a confidence game. And uh, 
Whereas a lot of the uh, kids that get picked up 18, 19, get drafted into their clubs and get nurtured, AFL, they just expect you to be at that level straight away. And you're kind of on your own. And I came coming out of the SANFL uh, competition where the umpires, we all kind of saw each other as the next team. So we all looked out for each, for each other, even though three are only going to umpire the grand final at the end. Whereas walking into AFL, yeah, you're out on your own. So sometimes, yeah, you get mentored and you get coached and you're out there doing those decisions. And at the end of the game, the media's got stuck into something. So you get hauled into the office during the week and going, yeah, fair enough there, but it's not really correct on what we want now. And you get a bad, bad mark. And so then they'd have to turn the umpiring system over. So um, towards the end of the season, yeah, it became obvious that I was in probably the bottom four. So um, and at risk of, yeah, uh, not actually being retained on the list for the second of the for another season. So um, yeah, and I stayed local in SANFL, so I was enjoying my time in the SANFL, and uh, yeah, pretty much I suppose what you can say, I got dropped off the list of AFL. So uh, as a result of that second season, so did uh, you take that uh, in a bad way or harshly, or uh, did you just regroup with your life? I mean, is, is there a point where you you look at yourself and say, well, did I do something wrong? Could I have been better? Oh, yeah, you certainly don't aim to do it. So um, it's certainly something that takes you by a shock. You do question yourself because I suppose as an elite athlete, you're constantly taught to back yourself and your gifts and your talents and what you're trying to achieve there. And when they're not working and then they're failing you and you're not achieving what you want to achieve, you start questioning yourself, you start doubting and you go, all right, who, well, who am I now then? If I'm not this, who am I? And so, yeah, coming then back into the SANFL system where you can start enjoying football, yeah, through those times of that second season, you start second guessing yourself and you're not doing things that you naturally would because you're trying to, you're trying to grasp onto something like the edge of a cliff before you actually fall off of it. So mm. you might do some silly things from time to time, just try, literally trying to do the best you can to stay hang on. But yeah, it's a hard time. Uh, everyone gets dropped. Like I think there's a t- statistic that says in the Australian cricket team, every player has been dropped. Yeah. So it's not necessarily about how do you cope with the promotion because that's kind of a given it's what happens when you're dropped and uh, that's when you really start to find out about yourself and what underpins you and gives you the foundation to who you are we're going to come back to that in uh, our next segment Um, uh, Dan I want to put some pressure on this AFL former AFL umpire because some of the decisions that we're seeing change and some of the rules that we're seeing change not all of us are in agreement with this and this holding the ball thing uh, pinned arms uh, concussion thing I mean you umpired 20 years ago Uh, were we seeing the same problem then and was it just going unnoticed that players were getting concussed or is this a new phenomenon where players are having these new form of tackling which pins down arms and forces them forward in a tackle and rubs their nose in the dirt type tackle which I reckon is in the back anyway but uh, let's yeah. just let's just say you said earlier you protected the ball player is there some part of this kind of tackling thing that we've seen for the last 20 years that has contributed to uh, maybe more concussions than what uh, we should be seeing well possibly you know umpiring is a different sport um, it's different to football. You know, you're running away from the football. You're not. You're looking at players, and you're trying to stay out of the way. So it's completely opposite to football. So there's a culture there of how you interpret the rules. Yeah, and I was always brought up to always look after the ball player. You look after the ball player, you get a great game of football, and the game goes quick. You start paying all. Yeah, even if the ticky touch, if you err on the side of the ball player. They're going to be looked after. The tackler then doesn't necessarily worry too much because they're going to go for the footy. Look, it's weird when you get the system and you look at the AFL that no one wants to pick the football up because they're all waiting for the tackle. And it's yeah. like, this is anti how I got I was raised in football. So mine would be, yeah, let's not focus so much. I think the AFL is trying to speed the game up by them rewarding the tackler. But in a way, it's reverse psychology because no one now wants to go and get the football. You end up in the situation now that now they're just practicing more tacklers, how you can keep the pressure on and tackle and tackle to bring that ball free to get the football. Mm. And I think player welfare is just critical in this place. And I think when you're comparing sports now and kids coming through, um, if, if one sport in particular is uh, you're vulnerable to concussion and serious injury, You've got to question it. So I think the AFL is doing the right thing in terms of trying to look after player welfare and to speed that game. But whether it's got too quick, I don't know. Well, you're talking about elite athletes too. So, Just related to that, I want to just backtrack a tiny bit. You mentioned you sort of get a, a grade after a game. What's that rating process like? Uh, is it you know a letter grade? Is it 
based on how many decisions you've got right and wrong, how many non-calls you've got right and wrong. Uh, yeah, talk us through that a little bit. Oh, you're bringing back some dark memories here, Dan. Um, <laughs> Flashbacks. I, of... I tried to get away from that. You know, it's like going through high school again and you're getting <laughs> yeah. graded all the time. So, yeah, every game you're ranked, you're ranked on bouncing, uh, free kicks that you've paid or haven't paid, uh, positioning is another one, and then your control or your, your player management on the game. So there's about four basic areas and then a few others. So, yeah, so you're getting scrutinised on all of these um, in different levels. So, yeah, and you're bouncing, you're kind of aiming for at least 80%, um, 80% through most things, you're doing pretty well. Uh, there's no such thing as a perfect game in umpiring. Like, you always do something, is because it's a human game. So, uh, I think, you know, the best games have probably got maybe got 98 or something. Like, there's always something. So, there you go, mm. Wayne. When we're, when we're booing at the telly at yes. home, sometimes we're actually right, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thought process comes that the game has changed. We all talk about this on the radio. We're quite often saying the game's changed. Uh, we seem to have this. Um, the Ross Line game change I see at the Tin Soldier one where you've got all these defenders coming up marching towards this group of people who are trying to ricochet their way between these Tin to Soldier defenders to get through them and then get over the top to Pagan's Paddock so that Eddie Betts or somebody like that can run onto the ball and kick a goal. Have you noticed that game change and do you, do you see that as detrimental to football given your background in country football and mine in country where I go out and don't watch that Tin Soldier stuff which I find refreshing? Yeah, it was very confronting. I remember, yeah, going through the hills and the, and to the SANFL football was very much a traditional footy. And I loved even coming out of the AFL, going back to the SANFL because it was traditional football. It was what you could relate to. You could kind of play that game. But I remember my like the second game in trial games of AFL was, was Pagan's Paddock, was Kangaroos versus Brisbane at Waverley. Big ground. And there was no one for the whole half of the ground. I'm thinking, what do I do? There's no one here. So, mm. uh, and a lot of others, other clubs now have subsequently brought it in. I think Paul Ruse brought that in in Sydney, uh, the whole basketball mentality as well, um, bringing all that into the game. I think, yeah, coaches are very smart. They deal, they've got players at their disposal who can run. They're just primarily athletes, so they're a lot fitter than they used to be because they know they need to play out of position. Whereas back in the day and country footy, you know, this is my position, this is what I'll do. I'm a team player, and away we go, we'll back the team in. So, um, yeah, it's uh, um, the game, yeah, it certainly has changed at AFL level uh, in that regards, in being open. How do you fix it? Probably through coaching. Um, you know, you watch some sides like at the moment, like Port Adelaide and Collingwood and those top sides that just take the game on now. It's refresh, refreshing to watch. So mm. I think that, that aspect it needs to keep coming. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very interesting uh, to talk about that. Okay, a couple more decisions that um, uh, we've uh, got. The the high tackle, getting rid of all of this business of uh, concussion. Uh, the duckers, the weavers that uh, have now, maybe umpires aren't paying those free kicks in front of goals that they used to pay uh, to, uh, like uh, Robbie Gray, I might just say from Port Adelaide, was good at ducking and uh, put, you know Clayton Bester, who's a port supporter, uh, he used to get paid a lot of free kicks in front of goal against the Crows usually. Um, so uh, are you seeing a change in umpiring, the way in which umpires do umpire? Yeah, I think well, the, in my time and uh, a bit after, there was a lot of pressure on just to get the right free kick all the time. So the interpreting the player wasn't necessarily always there. But uh, yeah, you see these days, um, it, it, it is a feel for the game. A lot of umpiring is about player management. So I remember umpiring like someone like a Jeff Farmer back in the day who could get quite hot-headed at times. But if you went up to him early in the game and just praised him about something, he would be have a great game. He wouldn't bother you. Uh, so your praise worked. I remember umpiring Glenn Archer. You know, you walk up to him and he's like glazed eyes and just like he'd just destroy you. So you, And if you don't stand up to him and sit there and give back, then as soon as you do that, he's like, okay, no worries, you've got it under control. I'll just keep going playing football. So... I think, yeah, like I remember growing up in B-grade footy in the hills and you get all these old codgers just trying to pull the wool over your eye every single second. So it's actually having that now as a football to go, all right, and are you just playing for this or are you not? Uh, AFL, um, AFL football, and I think it's renowned, is one of the hardest sports to umpire mm. because it's got so much interpretation. So a lot of other sports have it quite black and white, even cricket with TV and all sorts of things, football like soccer, different ways. But AFL is so in- intentional based. Where are your eyes focused? Are you focused on the football or the player? And that could be the difference between yeah. a free kick or not. So yeah. in a game where the guy's ducking or not, uh, is there intent to actually get the game going and get the football moving or are they actually trying to get a free kick and put themselves in harm's way because you don't want a player uh, you know, purposely putting themselves in harm's way. 
Right, one last question. You went back from AFL to SNFL. Then you went to country football and you became a Lutheran minister up in the Riverland. Uh, tell us about uh, one particular game that uh, happened up there uh, in uh, the what was the Independence now, the Murray Valley Footy League. Yeah, it was my first game. I remember rocking up. I was a new pastor in town and the Catholic priest was running umpiring at the same, came with his carton of eggs and a lettuce and said, can you come out and give us a hand? I said, sure. So out there and he said, all right, do this game out at Ramco. And I remember... Uh, walking in just before the game started, and there's a guy all official, and he said, oh, uh, who are you and what are you doing here? And he said, oh, I'm here because there's word on the street that these two sides hate each other, and it's going to be an all-in brawls. And I'm thinking, oh, here I am, <laughs> new pastor in the town. I'm from my local people, and it's all going to go to pear shape. So I thought, what do I do? And I remember walking out there, the guy I was with just froze. So he said, I don't know what to do. I said, oh, give me the footy. Here we go. And I remember standing in the middle of the ground, and the guy on the sirens honking and honking, come on up. Start the game, and every all the players are yelling at each other. I'm going to destroy you, and I'm sitting there going, "This is ridiculous." I yes. did not sign up for this, yeah. and I just stood there then with the ball in the air, and they started quietening down and looking at me. Oh, ump, you going to get it going? I said, "Not until you schmucks go for this football. If you don't, I'm going to have you." And they're going. You're the local pastor. You can't say any of that. So I think after about a dozen 50-metre penalties in the first quarter yep. and the goal umpires, you know, club came in and said, wow, that was incredible. Hopefully the players got the message. So certainly added for a lot of conversation in the main street during the week about this local new local pastor who'd rocked up in this game of football. So oh, yeah. Great story. Mm. We've got Richard Fox with us. Um, the, the implications of um, the, the situation where we get injury and uh, people um, can't continue their careers um, or maybe they're cut from a list um, and uh, some of the mental health issues around country sport and men's health too. They're topics that we're going to continue on our Friday night sports show talking with Richard Fox, former AFL umpire and uh, Lutheran pastor today and we're looking forward to continuing our talk with him after these messages. Night Sports Show, we've had the privilege of having Richard Fox, who is one of the, those very, very multi-skilled people. Um, he began a football career at a little place called Lobethal and then went into umpiring. He then from there took up a AFL umpiring role for a couple of years and then back into his um, preferred, um, um, I guess, passion in life, which is to uh, pastor people, to come alongside them, uh, to chaplain them. Uh, and in the sports world, that couldn't be any more uh, important in these days. Joining me in the studio too is Lisa Jay from our Sunday service too. It's the first time you've ever been on the Friday night sports show. Yeah, I wonder what was going on. You sort of, uh, you know, gave, you basically sprung it on me. <laughs> <laughs> We've roped you in because we're going to talk about uh, mental health um, and it's Men's Mental Health Week next week. So we just thought uh, as an entree to that and some of the important issues that we're seeing emerge, even in country football, uh, there's a whole range of things, injury to players, concussion injury, uh, drugs and alcohol, uh, the reality uh, of uh, whether uh, there is enough support structures in our country towns to cope with uh, what seems to be a never-ending cycle of increased um, abuse. Even domestic violence and things come through our local country football clubs. So uh, that is a backdrop um, that you mentioned about your faith and the importance of your faith uh, in determining you're going into an AFL umpiring career. But then in leaving it too, uh, it was important too. So perhaps explain what made you become a Lutheran minister. Oh, yeah. Um, I grew up in the church, so my family um, had a strong presence in the Lutheran church up at Lobethal. So we were you know, in, to be a citizen of Lobethal, you either had to be in the football club or in the church. So or both. Well just been both. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So we were both. And so, yeah, and I suppose I yeah really uh, had a passion to help people. I was involved in youth uh, and just to be caring for people. And I suppose football also gave me that sense of community uh, yes. like church does. So, and I suppose in football, yeah, you get the good and the bad, like in the church, you get good and bad and in society you do as well. So wherever you get people, that's a, and football clubs are like a microcosm mm. uh, of our society. And uh, I suppose things start coming a bit more obvious in places like a football club because people uh, kind of let their guards down a bit more. There's a camaraderie, a team, yes. and you start having, uh, potentially having, hopefully having conversations about different things and your awareness of what's going on in other people's lives starts coming to the fore. and But, yeah, how you help and support people in that, yeah, is, is the challenge and the opportunity. So 
You did that uh, even in your AFL career, didn't you, uh, where your faith became important to get alongside a guy that had been dropped, say, from umpiring that next week. Yeah, that's right. Everyone pretty much goes through being dropped, and my coach would give me a wink and a nudge and say, oh, yeah, this guy's going through a tough spell or being dropped and struggling to work out when next steps. So I'd often go and just catch up with them, sit with them. Often it's just to listen to their story, get them to tell me the story. And often it started with a lot of whinging, so <laughs> going how life is just so unfair. And that's fine. That's the starting point. We're all there at times. So, and But to listen to it and then you know, trying to walk with them in the journey and remind them that there's a lot more than football. Uh, there, for most of them, there is potentially another game either next week, next season, or wherever it is to aim for. Uh, Other things in life, potentially, uh, as well. But just to listen to them. Each of them is quite unique and different, so um, it's never easy to take being dropped. So, And sometimes... If you don't have an outlet, you don't know where to go. So to be able to sit with some of these people and just walk with them and see them rise and turn and then have another go and, Mm -hmm. yeah, because you learn through those bad times better than the good times. You know, Richard, I find that so refreshing because to listen to somebody these days, I don't think that really happens quite much, Mm. uh, unfortunately. You've got to get alongside people and actually spend the time and listen, not to offer solutions or whatever, but just actually properly listen to what they have to say and I think that debriefing is so empowering because once they actually work out what is happening to them uh, the, the the initial shock of not being able to be selected and then going through the process of that emotionally and then trying to work through well what can I do in the meantime how can I cope with this news and I think it's really vital to be able to have somebody like a chaplain to come alongside and actually support people in this process because well Sporting, it's it's so competitive, isn't it? And yes. uh, once you've actually been dropped or, you know, you have that disappointment, then you've got to keep up with your fitness. There's still lots of other things that you've got to keep going with. So, yeah, it's it's a difficult process. Yeah, we've all got something. You know, I'm, I'm a believer everyone's got a story. We're always wrestling with something. And you, whether it's chaplains or even just your best mate or mates or people in the football club, I think we all have a role to play. Like, And it's a case of, okay, yeah, I've got all this issue. My mate's got this issues. It's it's downing tools a little bit and saying, all right, no, I, I, it might be a case. I don't know what to say to him. Actually, sometimes the best thing is to not say anything, but mm-hmm. just give them the time and space to air it themselves. And often people find the solution somewhere in their story That's right. or the next step. And be able to provide those moments and also remind each other you're never alone. You know, some of these things that you deal with in life, you think you're the only one mm-hmm. and no one's going to understand, no one loves you and all everything just gets more and more depressing on you. But to actually realise as soon as you take that first step of just sharing with someone, say, look, mate, I just need to tell someone, can I talk to you about something? Mm. And then they say, yeah, okay, what is it? And you start somewhere. Yeah, hopefully then that starts breeding and and building something there um, to realise that you're never alone. Mm. Uh, There's often people that you don't even realise are are potentially wrestling with the same thing. Mm. And to actually take that first step can actually build you as a person, build you as a community and give you hope. That's right. I think the competitive nature of sport in general and just having to be selected to be able to make the grade, to be able to do that and then not meeting that goal is very very, very disappointing and yeah. it can be shattering. And, um, not, and not having your identity wrapped up in it. Like mm. a lot of people wrap their identity at what they're achieving and what they're doing, but you're actually more than that. You're, that's right. You, you are a person, you're a human, you're loved and, and you know, my faith in being Christian, God loves you. That's right. God cares for you, whether you're a football or a sports person or not. Um, yes, you've got some special talents and gifts that you've been given that you can use and wherever that takes you, so be it. But most importantly, you're loved. Exactly. And that's what we need to hear. And also so that God can actually help you through that process of disappointment because uh, unfortunately you, you, your fitness does then when you're talking high level elite sport it doesn't take much for that momentum of fitness to actually be a shortfall and that is really anxiety prone uh, when when you realize that you're not meeting that grade and you know how much effort and work you have to do to meet that elite level again and you know how much you have to do to actually come back up to that level and that is the pressure that yeah, people and, are under. And when you can't back your own skills and your own abilities that's mm. when you really start having trouble when you go well, what who am I then what can I do yes and I think it's going back to the basics being yes. a person so finding a mate talking taking just the next step maybe and a lot of it it's just being kind 
kind to ourselves. And we've all been Stop there. Stop putting the expectations on yourself. Just be kind. That's so, right. I want to ask about um, some of the crises that we've seen in football in recent years. We, the, the Phil Walsh situation uh, at the Adelaide Crows, um, the most traumatic situation, uh, and uh, the reality was that chaplains came in uh, and supported. Uh, I know the uh, impact of both Port Adelaide and the Crows through that situation uh, was that the players, the counselling, the support structures that they received. H- how does a, a crisis like that uh, for an umpire or, say, a football field one. We've had um, a couple of uh, younger players die on a football field, one in Victoria recently at uh, Castlemaine, uh, another up in the Adelaide Hills uh, at um, the Gamaraka. Uh, you've been in uh, a chaplaincy role, but also in an umpiring role. How do you cope with those, both the immediate situation mm. of that crisis and then the um, follow-up after that? Yeah, they're not moments that you anticipate and you never really want to anticipate. So you're never sure how you're going to react. A lot of it is trying to provide the time and space for people to work through their emotions and what's going on. Mm. The worst thing you can do is bottle up and think everything is going to be fine. Um, Yeah, you can kind of say that, but a lot of it's keeping calm and keeping in the process. But allowing people to go through the journey or whatever their journey may be, everyone will have different reactions. I remember being on a footy field where they had to call an ambulance on and we had to stop the game for like over half an hour and wait for all the things going on um, and I think it was Sean Wren was the coach at the time and came out and he asked us he said can I go on the ground and we said sure go on the ground bring your players in have a conversation mm. and it's trying to be human trying That's to right. provide those times and spaces to actually work through those events so I remember um, a guy that actually came and listened to uh, Messages of Hope uh, was a football coach at the time and in the football world and in the like and he came thankfully you know to hear the hope of Jesus and 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 end, end up becoming a coach uh, at the Adelaide Lutheran Football Club. And they had a tragic uh, event where a young guy uh, fell over and died at training. And uh, so he was there at that time and just gave people the time to talk and to share and so to be. Vital. And he shared his message of what gives him hope. Because I think at the end of the day, we're all looking for hope. Um, whether we're being dropped or whether we're hoping for our football team to win is a different kind of hope. But to actually have that hope and that grounding that will help you get through the next step. And whether that's family, friends, or a combination of all, or my, for me, it's my faith. And I've seen that in others as well. Having that grounded faith helps you. So if there are clubs that are listening now and perhaps they want to be able to get support like a chaplain, what would be the process? How would they go about doing that? Yeah, well, chaplains are more prevalent than ever. I, my, my suggestion would be contact your local church to start with. Um, look up who who is there. They're probably either, whether it's the pastor or someone in the church there, could then connect them. Um, yeah, Christian schools have got chaplains as well, uh, and that might be some kind of leads in there. But the local community is probably best if there's someone there that the local club can then call upon. It doesn't have. To, it's just a volunteer role or capacity. Mm. So just someone to be there and help. So yeah, that's very what I much suggest. so. Sports Chaplaincy SA. There's also Sports Chaplaincy Victoria and Sports Chaplaincy New South Wales. Uh, they have branches. and They do train folk who, uh, like yourself, um, you've obviously received a greater level of training because uh, you're pastoring uh, a denominational church. But the uh, reality is, somebody just in the community who has a faith that wants to provide practical love and support and care around their own sports club can do so through chaplaincy um, and those chaplaincy numbers through that website. You can go to chaplaincy for Chaplaincy Australia and they've got them for all AFL clubs too, which I think is fantastic. I think the umpires actually too yes. um, have that, um, that with them too. So this has been a fascinating time, Richard, to uh, get inside your head as a young footballer and then as a uh, AFL umpire and then uh, to hear some of your work and uh, the work that you do with Messages of Hope to conclude and the importance of um, supporting everyone around us in our community. Richard, um, thanks for joining us on our uh, Friday night sports show and our repeat on Saturday morning. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you so much for having me and listening to my stories. So uh, It's been a privilege to be here with you. I love listening to Flo and all that you're doing. So bring the sports broadcast out to people so keep it up <laughs> no we really appreciate your energy richard and we can see you're very sincere about what you do so we thank, thank you. you lisa and that is a look at what's happening with richard fox more on the friday night sports show still to come